And in that spirit, it is my pleasure to welcome the next President of the United States, Bernie Sanders. Beautiful evening. <laughs> no, I am not going to sing. That, that you don't want to hear. Is the yeah the mic is loud enough? You can hear me back there. All right. Let me thank Dave Gutter uh, for his music. Let me thank Marco Allen for his very pungent comments, and let me thank Sonny Singe for his uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you all very much. You know, I, I wish that I could be here this evening uh, and tell you that as president, we don't have to make major changes in this country that, you know, we need to do a little bit here and a little bit there and things will be great. I wish I could tell you that. But if I did, I would be lying to you. We are living in an unprecedented moment in American history. And in fact, given climate change, we are living in an unprecedented moment in the modern history of human civilization. And given that reality, we need an unprecedented campaign to win, and we need an unprecedented presidency to do what has to be done, and I intend to do all of that and more. So these are unprecedented moments and what I am asking of you all is not just to help me win here in New Hampshire, I am asking that. <laughs> I'm not just asking for your help to enable me to win the Democratic nomination, I am asking you that. And I'm not even just asking your help to defeat the most dangerous president in the history of this country. I'm asking more. I am asking your help the day after we are inaugurated, and I use that word we advisedly, the day after we are inaugurated to begin the process of transforming this country and creating an economy and a government that works for all of us, not just the 1%. Yeah. And to be honest, with you, to be very honest with you, what our campaign is trying to do has never been done in American history. We are not just taking on the Republican establishment and Donald Trump. We're not just taking on the Democratic establishment. We're not just taking on Wall Street and the insurance companies and the drug companies and the fossil fuel industry not just taking on the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex, we are taking on the whole damn 1%. And the reason that we are doing that is not for some abstract academic reason, the reason that we are doing that is that is the only way that we bring about the changes that this country desperately needs. The history of America, in fact, the history of the world, is that the only time real change, fundamental change, ever takes place is when millions of people stand up, struggle, and demand justice, and that is what this campaign is about. It is a justice campaign. <laughs> And I'm talking about economic justice, I'm talking about social justice, I'm talking about racial justice, I am talking about environmental justice, I am talking about a government that works with all people and a government that leads the world in trying to cut back the amount of money we spend on the military and increase the money we spend on fighting climate change. Yeah. 
Now let me briefly pass over Donald Trump. I don't want to spend a lot of time on him. Not worth it. Let me just say this. Donald Trump will be impeached shortly. And then the trial goes to the Senate where I sit. And today, this evening, I ask Mitch McConnell to do the right thing and make sure that the Senate begins that trial immediately after the impeachment process is over. And I am asking, I am asking my Republican colleagues in the Senate to have the courage to stand up to Trump. I'm asking them to have the courage to listen to the testimony objectively and to reach their conclusion and to put the future of America ahead of their short-term political interest. That's what I'm asking the Republican Party to do. But this campaign is a lot is about a lot more than, do, than just Donald Trump. It is about asking the American people to think big, not small. It is remembering what Nelson Mandela said in a very short sentence which captured, I think, everything we're trying to do in this campaign. And he said, it always seems impossible until it is done. You understand what that means? It always seems impossible until it is done. And what that means is that it is imperative that we have a vision for the future of America that is big, not small. A vision that talks about justice. A vision that understands that once we educate and organize millions of people to stand up and fight for justice, there is nothing that we cannot accomplish. And what this campaign is about is looking at some very hard truths. Truths that Congress does not deal with, truths that the media, generally speaking, does not deal with. And we've got to look at the power structure of America, something we very rarely talk about. And we've got to look at the fact that today we have more income and wealth inequality in America than any time since the 1920s. And that means that today, if you can believe it, we got three people owning more wealth than the bottom half of American society. Three people. You have the top 1% owning more wealth than the bottom 92%. You have people in New Hampshire and Vermont working two or three jobs. 49% of all new income today goes to the top 1%. You got people like Jeff Bezos worth $150 billion dollars while at the same time, a half a million Americans will be sleeping out on the streets tonight because we are not doing anything that we should in terms of affordable housing. And while the rich get richer, you have half of the American people living paycheck to paycheck, worried about whether or not they can afford to go to the doctor or pay their rent. Under our administration, with your help, that is going to change. I have, I have recently been criticized for introducing the strongest tax on wealth that any presidential candidate has ever offered. And what that means, that means at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, we are going to tell the billionaire class in this country that not only are they going to pay more in taxes, they're going to pay significantly more in taxes. Yeah. Under our proposal, somebody like a Jeff Bezos 
would pay nine billion dollars a year more in taxes. Sounds like a lot of money, but it would be Trump change for Jeff Bezos. Leaves him with about 140 to try to get by, 140 billion. <laughs> I know it's tough, Jeff, but I think you could probably do it. But we can take that nine billion and double the amount of money, just from one person, double the amount of money we spend on Head Start in America and make sure that millions of kids finally get the early childhood education that they need. Those are the priorities. Those are the priorities. That's what we have to deal with as a nation, whether we allow so few to have so much when so many families are struggling. But it's not only a rigged economy, it is a corrupt, and I use that word advisedly, a corrupt political system. And that is as a result of Citizens United, what we have now are billionaires buying elections all over this country and buying candidates who represent the wealthy and the powerful. We are gonna work assiduously to do everything we can to overturn Citizens United and move to public funding of elections. In New England, we have an old concept. It's called the town meeting. It's one person, one vote. And that is what I believe should be happening in America. I don't believe billionaires should buy elections. I think we're gonna end the voter suppression that is taking place all over this country, including here in New Hampshire. And I wanna congratulate the governor here. He understands something. He understands that if young people get out and vote, we can transform politics in America. He understands that. That's why he is trying to make it harder for young people to vote. But we are saying to him, sorry, it ain't gonna work. You're only gonna get young people even more angry and disgusted with the status quo. They are gonna come out to vote in large numbers. And to the young people here, let me say this. Let me say this to the young people. Your generation is the most progressive young generation in the history of this country. You are a generation which has opposed racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia and religious bigotry. That is the very good news and you should be proud of that. Here is the bad news. The bad news is your generation does not vote in anywhere near the numbers that it should. The older generation votes in significantly higher numbers than your generation. And if you could vote at the same rate as the older folks, we could transform this country. And I beg of you to do that. And when we stand together and we take Trump's effort, we, we beat Trump's effort to try to divide us up by the color of our skin or our sexual orientation, when we stand together, we can accomplish extraordinary things. And it gets back to what Mandela said, think big, not small. What can we do? I'll give you an example. I came here to New Hampshire four years ago. I talked about raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, and everybody told me I was crazy, too radical an idea. Well, the American people, workers, have stood up, and now we have seven states in the U.S. House of Representatives that have already voted to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. We are going where we talk about wages finally do what should have been done years ago and mandate equal pay for equal work. <laughs> Women should not be making 80 cents on the dollar. And we're going to make it easier for workers to join unions. Four years ago, I came here to New Hampshire and I said, you know what, the world is changing. Education, higher education has got to change. And we have got to make public colleges and universities tuition free. Four years ago, 
That was a radical idea. Today, 12 states have moved in that direction. Just last week, the state of New Mexico said that for all of their residents, public colleges and universities will be tuition free. NYU, NYU, Columbia, and Cornell universities have made tuition free for medical students. We're going to increase Pell Grants, substantially increase Pell Grants and work study programs so that any person in this country who goes to college, public or private, will leave school without being in debt. And I'll tell you what else we're going to do. It may seem like a radical idea. It is not a radical idea. We're going to cancel all student debt in America. And I, want, see, and I want you to think, when you think big, you ask yourselves the following questions. How could it be that 11 years ago, against my vote, Congress voted to bail out the crooks on Wall Street who nearly destroyed our entire economy? And not only $700 billion from the Treasury, but trillions of dollars in zero interest loans from the Federal Reserve. How come two years ago, Trump and his friends in Congress were able to pass legislation providing over a trillion dollars in tax breaks to the top 1% and large profitable corporations? Thinking big is about imagining a government that works for all of us and not just the 1%. So if we could bail out the crooks on Wall Street, if we give good, huge tax breaks to billionaires who don't need them, we damn well can cancel all student debt in this country. And we pay for it through a very modest tax on Wall Street speculation. Four years ago, I came to New Hampshire, and I want to thank many of you for the support you gave me four years ago. Four years ago, I came to New Hampshire, and I said that it is an international embarrassment that the United States of America is the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a human right. That I believed since in my entire adult life that whether you are rich, whether you are poor, whether you're middle class, you have a right to go to a doctor when you need to, regardless of your income. Now, four years ago, four years ago, the idea of health care as a human right seemed like a radical idea once again, because the American people are standing up on this issue. Today, it is no longer a radical idea, and a majority of the American people, in one form or another, believe in a Medicare for all single-payer program. And the reason that they do is they can see with their own eyes the cruelty and dysfunctionality of the current health care system. Please understand that in America today, we spend twice as much per person as do the people of any other country, Canada or Europe. We're spending $11,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country. And what we get for that is 87 million Americans uninsured or underinsured. We get 30,000 Americans a year dying because they don't go to the doctor when they should. We get 500,000 people going bankrupt because of medical debt and others seeing their credit shot because they can't afford to pay off their medical bills. What we get for this is paying by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. And at the end of all that, while so many of our people are uninsured or underinsured, the healthcare industry last year made a hundred billion dollars in profit. So what this effort is about, it's not a debate over health care, because nobody can defend the dysfunctionality and the waste in the current system. <clears throat> what this is about is whether the American people are prepared to take on the greed and corruption 
of the insurance industry and of the pharmaceutical industry. And I believe we are prepared to do that, and I believe that in the very short time, we are going to pass a Medicare for All single-payer program. And let me be clear about what that means. Make, let me be as clear as I can be. It means no more premiums. It means no more co-payments. It means no more deductibles or out-of-pocket expenses. It means that if you end up, God forbid, in a hospital with a serious procedure, you walk out of that hospital without owing a nickel because health care is a human right. It means, it means funding health care like virtually every other major country does, out of the general tax base in a way that is progressive, excludes the first $29,000 of income, no taxes on that. And at the end of the day, the overwhelming majority of American people will be paying less for health care than they do now, and they're gonna have comprehensive health care, including hearing aids, dental care, eyeglasses, and home health care. So this evening, I am here to ask for your help. The health care industry made $100 billion last year. They're going to spend many hundreds of millions of dollars on dishonest TV ads and radio ads and you name it. When you see an ad on television telling you how bad Medicare for All is or how bad Bernie Sanders is, understand who is paying for those ads. And those are the drug companies that are charging us 10 times more for insulin in this country as they do in Canada. It is the insurance industry that pays their CEOs tens of millions of dollars a year in compensation. I believe from the bottom of my heart that the more people understand about the dysfunctionality of this system, we're gonna win this fight and we are going to have, finally, a Medicare for All single-payer health care system. Now, our self-described genius of a president, and if you ask him, he will tell you that he is a genius, according to Donald Trump, he believes that climate change is a hoax. I believe that Donald Trump is a hoax. And I believe that it is imperative, and this is no small thing, that it is imperative to have a president of the United States who actually believes in science and does not simply listen to the lies of the fossil fuel industry. You all know, you all know what the scientists are telling us. They're telling us that the situation today is severe, that there is incredible damage already being done in our country and all over the world. You all have seen what happened to the Bahamas, so what happened to Puerto Rico, you heard about Katrina, you heard about the forest fires out west. I was to Paradise, California a couple of months ago. And Paradise is where they had that terrible fire in the midst of the California drought. It was unbelievable. This is a town of 28,000 people. 86 people were killed. 18,000 structures were destroyed or damaged. And to rebuild that community is going to require something like $16 billion. That is one town. That is one town. And all over the world right now, you're seeing increased drought. You're seeing heat waves in Australia, India, Pakistan, Europe, United States. And the Amazon, absolutely. All right? So what we have got to do, this is, and what the scientists are telling us, and this is scary stuff, what they are saying is that we have all of 12 years or less in order to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy, or else, or else there will be irreparable damage, damage that cannot be repaired in our country and around the world. We've got a very short period of time. 
And I am very proud to tell you that our campaign, uniquely of all of the candidates out there, we have listened to the scientists and we have introduced the most comprehensive and aggressive climate change program ever introduced, I believe, not only for presidential candidates, but by any candidate running for federal office. Now, I have, been, I have been criticized, as I often am, no matter what I do, but because people say, well, it's just too expensive. It's a $16 trillion program over the next 10 to 15 years. It's a very expensive proposal. But you tell me what the alternative is. You tell me how much we should not be spending in order to save the planet for our children and our grandchildren. I don't have a number. I think we have got to do everything humanly possible to save this planet. And the proposal that I've introduced puts teeth into the Green New Deal. It will create up to 20 million good paying jobs, retrofitting buildings all over this country electrifying our transportation system and making massive investments in wind, solar, geothermal, and other sustainable energies. Now, what makes this issue even more difficult than it is, is that it's not just an American issue. It's one thing to say we have to transform our own energy system. We gotta do it all over the world. And the leadership that I will provide as President of the United States, don't know that it works, don't know that it doesn't. But my leadership will say to countries all over the world that right now as a planet, unbelievably, we are spending over one and a half trillion dollars every single year on weapons of destruction designed to kill each other. And what I will attempt to do is to try to convince world leaders all over this planet, that instead of spending money on weapons of destruction, we should pool our resources and fight against our common enemy, which is climate change. Now, the only way, this is tough stuff, transforming the energy system in this country and around the world is enormously difficult. <clears throat> and the only way we're going to succeed is once again when millions of people stand up and tell the fossil fuel industry that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of our planet. And I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you something else. Many of you are aware that some major drug companies are now being sued by attorneys general all over the country for selling opioids that they knew were addictive. So these guys, the drug companies, were selling a product they knew was addictive, knew was killing people, but they were more concerned about their short-term profits. And it's the same exact thing with the fossil fuel industry. Their scientists at ExxonMobil and elsewhere, they have been telling their CEOs for years that the cause of climate change is what they are producing. And what they have done, the leadership of those companies have lied. They put millions of dollars into organizations trying to obfuscate the truth about climate change. As President of the United States, I will hold those individuals accountable. We have more people in jail today in the United States of America than any other country, including China. Ask yourselves how we have more people in America in jail than a communist authoritarian country like China, four times our size. And the people in jail are disproportionately black, Latino, and Native American. So we are going to bring about and lead the effort for real criminal justice reform in America. We're going to invest in our young people in jobs and education, not more jails or incarceration.
We are going to end private prisons and detention centers. In we are going to end the so-called war on drugs, which has destroyed so many lives. And we're going to legalize marijuana and, it, and, and expunge the records of those people arrested for possession of marijuana. And I came up with that thought when I was in Nevada a few weeks ago. And you drive down the roads in Nevada where marijuana is legal, and you see these big billboards, and they say, buy marijuana here and buy marijuana there. Large corporations there are selling marijuana. They are doing exactly what people in jail did. And that does not make any sense to me. So we are going to expunge the records of all people arrested for possession of marijuana. And then we have the issue where we have a racist president who is trying to demonize the undocumented people in this country. And that is what demagogues always do. They think they can retain their power by dividing us up based on the color of our skin or where we were born or our sexual orientation or our religion. That is what demagogues like Trump always do. We are not going to demonize the undocumented. We are going to move toward comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. <laughs> On my first day in office, we will once again bring legal protection for the 1.8 million young people in the DACA program. Brothers and sisters, we are going to end the ugly situation we now see on our southern borders. We are going to develop a humane border policy, which will never have federal agents snatching babies from the arms of their mothers. We will not be separating families. We will not be putting children into cages. We will have a rational and humane asylum process. Many of my conservative colleagues in the Congress, their mantra is small government and getting the government off of the back of the American people. Leave the American people alone. Let them do whatever they want, except when it comes to a woman's right to control her own body. I happen to believe that a woman's right to control her own body is a constitutional right. And, is, and my very simple promise to you, this for me is not very difficult, is to tell you that I will never ever nominate any person to the Supreme Court who is not 100% pro Roe versus Wade. All of us are horrified when we turn on the TV and we read or see about another horrible mass shooting. And we keep asking ourselves, how does this happen in America? that some demented human being comes in and starts mowing down people. The good news is that all across this country, in rural states like Vermont and New Hampshire, urban communities, Los Angeles, New York, there is now a general consensus of some of the things that have to be done if we're going to combat gun violence in America. Widespread agreement that we have to make sure that we expand background checks that people with violent paths should not own guns. There is widespread support for ending the so-called gun show loophole, which allows people to avoid background checks. There is widespread support for ending the so-called straw man provision, which allows somebody to legally buy a gun and then sell those guns to criminals. And there is now, amazingly enough, and this only happened in the last few months, I think El Paso and Dayton did it, there is now widespread support 
for banning the sale and distribution of assault weapons in this country. Now, you might ask yourselves, why, if that is what the American people want, why isn't the government doing it? And you know the answer. The answer is we have Republican leadership that is intimidated and scared to death of the NRA. Well, you're looking at somebody who, as president, will not be intimidated by the NRA. We're going to do the right thing. Let me just maybe get back to what I said when I began. Our campaign is a little bit different than other campaigns because I'm not here just to ask for your vote, which I am. <laughs> Please don't forget that in passing, I am asking for your vote. <laughs> Humbly, respectfully, I'm asking for your help to win here in action. But I am asking something more of you, and I truly am. The mantra of our campaign, which I believe from the bottom of my heart, is us, not me. And the reason for that is that at the end of the day, no president, not Bernie Sanders or anybody else, can bring about the changes that we need by himself or herself. Can't be done by one person, no matter how well-intentioned that president may be. And the reason for that is if you look at the power of the 1%, if you look at the power of Wall Street, the drug companies, the insurance companies, and the military industrial complex, and all of these people, they have unbelievable power. In fact, right now, they love the status quo because without exception, they are doing phenomenally well. Record-breaking profits, massive transfer of wealth from the middle class to the 1%, they are doing great. And they will do everything they can to maintain the status quo. But what I believe is that while the 1%, and I deal with these guys as a U.S. Senator all of the time, trust me, they have unbelievable power. They own the media. They have enormous influence over legislation in the House and in the Senate, etc. But at the end of the day, the 1% is 1%. That's what they are. And we are 99%. And while I don't have a PhD from Dartmouth in mathematics, I do know, I do know that 99% is a hell of a lot bigger number than 1%. Now Republicans, Republicans in Trump, they attempt, or will attempt, to win this election by doing everything they can to get billionaires to support them and they will do everything they can to suppress the vote and make it harder for young people, people of color, working people to vote. And our view of politics is exactly the opposite. We're going to get money out of politics and we're going to expand the voter base. We will win this election if we have the largest voter turnout in American history. And the only way we do that is when by the millions young people become involved in the political process. So what I'm here today to tell you, and I'm here to tell you honestly, not just for me, but for your own futures. If you're concerned about the corruption in politics, if you're concerned about racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia and religious bigotry, if you are concerned about climate change, if you're concerned about leaving school $100,000 in debt. If you are concerned about these and many, many other issues that we didn't even get into tonight, if you're concerned about them, you cannot sit it out. And it means not just voting, it means acting like your life and the planet are dependent upon who wins this election, which is what the case is. We are fighting we are fighting to maintain democracy. We are fighting for justice. We are fighting to save the planet. And we can do extraordinary things if we understand that in this unprecedented moment in history, we need to act in an unprecedented way. That means 
that if each of you reaches out to three or four of your friends who have given up on the political process and make sure they vote. If you go out and make the phone calls for our campaign and knock on the doors that have to be knocked on. Not only can we win here in New Hampshire, not only can we defeat Trump, but most importantly, we can transform this country, we can save the planet, and we can create a government that works for everybody and not just wealthy campaign contributors. Thank you all very much.